Prologue, part three. This ancient Egyptian idea of an assessment by 42 gods is paralleled in the Oriental teachings by the beings referred to as Lepikas by H.P. Blavatsky in her book, The Secret Doctrine, volume one, page 129, and I quote, the esoteric meaning is that those who have been called Lepikas, the recorders of the karmic ledger, make an impassable barrier between the personal ego and the impersonal self, the noumenon and parent source of the former, hence the allegory. They circumscribe the manifested world within the ring past knot." End quote. The esoteric significance of the number 42 is further deepened by the early Christian writer, Clement of Alexandria, circa 150 to 215 AD, who stated that the complete corpus of Hermetic writings consisted of 42 sacred books that were bequeathed to the ancient Egyptians by Hermes Trismegistus and were concerned with the 42 aspects of sacred knowledge. The number 42 is also mentioned in the Kabbalistic text, the Zohar, 2, 234a, where it says in reference to the first 42 letters of the opening verse of Genesis, quote, the world was etched and established with 42 letters, all of them a crown of the holy name, end quote. Furthermore, the world was not only created via the number 42, but also received its redemption through the agency of the number 42, through the connection of the 42 generations between Abraham and Christ Jesus, as given in the Gospel of St. Matthew 1, 17. And I quote, So all the generations from Abraham unto David are 14 generations, and from David unto the carrying away to Babylon 14 generations, and from the carrying away to Babylon under the Christ 14 generations." End quote. These 42 generations integrated cosmic processes into the hereditary stream through 42 stages, consisting of three groups of 14 stages. These three groups were each concerned respectively with three different aspects of the perfected humanity of Christ Jesus, the physical body, the etheric body, and the astral body. This integration of cosmic processes into the humanity of Christ Jesus had to come about in preparation for his becoming the new Lord of Karma and thereby entering directly into cosmic evolution processes of the earthly human realm. For the cosmic evaluation process of the Akashic time content of the individual is, so to speak, coordinated by one's guardian angel and comes about through angelic beings, or lapikas, that are under the direction of the Elohim, or spirits of form, and so are working within the cosmic forces of the seventh zodiacal constellation, the scales of Libra, a process that in the past took place under the inspiration of the solar logos, the great sun being El Elyon, the most high God that was spoken of by Melchizedek to Abraham, working with the forces of the opposite constellation, the Ram of Ares. In the ancient Egyptian mysteries, this was experienced through the workings of the solar Elohim, under the inspiration of the solar logos. In the time of Moses, the nature of the cosmic process underwent a profound change in order to bring about a further unfoldment of the divine plan. For the solar logos had ceased to participate and would have become the decadent Egyptian mysteries. And by a change from working through the agency of the solar spirits of form to the lunar spirit of form, Jehovah Elohim, the solar logos led Moses out of Egypt. For while Moses had previously presided over the sun mysteries at Heliopolis, 
the great sun being that had been experienced in the ancient Egyptian mysteries as Osiris, departed and continued to work directly with Moses through the lunar spirit of form, Jehovah Elohim. These events had to take place in preparation for the incarnation of Christ and culminated in Christ becoming the new Lord of Karma by entering directly into earth evolution at the grail mystery which took place through the crucifixion upon the hill of Golgotha. Many other profound levels of meaning can be found in the myth of Osiris. For example, Osiris had been slain by his brother Set or Araman and dismembered into 14 pieces that were strewn throughout the length of Egypt. This can be seen as representing on one level the seven dual aspects of initiation. Seven plus seven is 14. And by permutation, the 49 fires of creation, seven times seven is 49. In her Theosophical Glossary, H.P. Blavatsky provides us with further insights into these mysteries of Osiris. Of the many supreme gods, this Egyptian conception of Osiris is the most suggestive and the grandest, as it embraces the whole range of physical and metaphysical thought. As a solar deity, he had 12 minor gods under him, the 12 signs of the zodiac. Though his name is the ineffable, his 42 attributes bore each one of his names, and his seven dual aspects completed the 49, or seven times seven. The former symbolized the 14 members of his body, or twice seven. Thus the god is blended in man, and the man is deified into a god. As it is in harmony with these ancient traditions, I have elected to use the 22 major arcana of the tarot as a trestle board to symbolize the 22 facets of the modern grail path of initiation, which, in the progress of human evolution, has necessarily changed to meet the vastly different consciousness of modern humanity. As can be seen in Grail Diagram number 1, see Part 4, the sequence of the 22 arcana is composed of the numbers 3, 7, and 12. 3 plus 7 plus 12 equals 22. These three numbers relate respectively to the three alchemical elements of sulfur or fire, mercury or fluidity, and salt, solidity, and the seven planetary spheres in the ancient sense, which includes the realms that are circumscribed by the sun and moon and the five planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And lastly, the 12 constellations of the zodiac. Uh, it should be noted the references in this book refer to the 12 constellations of the fixed stars, which are referred to as the sidereal zodiac, as distinguished from the 12 signs of the tropical zodiac of common astrology, which are the 12 divisions of the four seasons. This fundamental series of 22 ideas can be approached from a threefold point of view. The threefold point of view is the central element of all genuine occult teachings and is also present present within the less esoteric commentaries. For example, the threefold point of view is discussed within the philosophical commentaries on the Torah known as the Yemenite Midrash. Within this collection from medieval Yemen of traditional commentaries on the Pentateuch or five books of Moses is contained a work entitled Midrash Ha Hephes. In this text is contained a discourse on the threefold nature of reality. It is based on the line from Genesis 12, 7, where it says in reference to Abraham, and there he builded an altar unto the Lord. Within the Midras ha Hephes, the commentary speaks of the building of three altars by Abraham as representing the three fundamental aspects of existence. The first, which he built upon hearing the Lord's promise of land for him, relates to the world of bodies. The second, which he built upon taking possession of this promised land, is the soul world. And the third, because he was rescued from ur relates to the intellectual or spiritual world. 
The first world being indicated by the senses, the second by the motion of bodies, and the third by the desire of the souls to understand. In keeping with the threefold view of the world, the author of the Midrash HaHefes affirms that it is because the world is threefold that the angels chant a thrice holy hymn. This reference to a thrice holy hymn is an allusion to the sacred prayer of the seraphim, which can be found in Isaiah 6, 1 through 3, where it says, and I quote, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, and two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two did he fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Another thrice holy hymn that acknowledges the threefold nature of sacred wisdom is the well-known Christian hymn, Holy, 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 which proclaims, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, God in three persons, Blessed Trinity. This threefold nature, the Divine Holy Trinity, is in turn reflected in the three times three or nine orders of angelical hierarchies, and in another manner is also reflected in the threefold nature of the human being, which consists of spirit, soul, and body. It is perhaps appropriate at this point to say that it is not without some hesitation that I have pursued the writing of a book which is concerned with such sacred matters. In light of this, I am reminded of the words of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, and I quote, People act as if that incomprehensible and highest being, who is far beyond the reach of thought, were only their equal. Otherwise, they could not say, the Lord God, the dear God, the good God. This saying becomes to them, especially to the clergy who have it on their lips every day, only an expression, an empty name, to which no thought whatsoever is connected. If his greatness had oppressed them so much, they would be speechless and out of reverence, unwilling to say his name.